Welcome back folks and subject of today's video is going to be empirical formula of a compound. Now we've talked about formulas of compounds up to this point and the primary kind of formula that we've dealt with is going to be the molecular formula which is the actual formula of the compound. As it turns out an empirical formula by definition is going to be the simplest mathematical reduction of the molecular formula. So let's take a look at a few examples of molecular formulas versus empirical formulas for a given compound to see how the two relate to one another. So here I have molecular formulas for um, four different compounds. Now keep in mind, these are the actual formulas of these compounds. All right, so for example, we know that a molecule of water is made up of two atoms of hydrogen bonded to a single oxygen. And we can make the same argument for any of these other compounds here. Now, to uh, come up with the empirical formula, which again is the simplest mathematical reduction of the original molecular formula, all we have to do is to see whether we can reduce the formula down mathematically. Now, in the case of the CH4, there's no way that I can reduce this down mathematically without actually ending up with fractional amounts here in the subscripts. All right? So, the molecular formula of CH4 is the same as the empirical formula of CH4. We can make the same argument for water. The molecular formula will be the same as the empirical formula. There's no way that I can actually mathematically reduce that formula down. However, if I have hydrogen peroxide here, which is H2O2, you can see that I can divide both of these numbers through by 2 and end up with H1O1. So you can see in this particular case that the empirical formula is different from the molecular formula. And you can see in this case that this formula is the simplest mathematical reduction of the original molecular formula. Likewise with C2H6 here, a simple hydrocarbon. I can divide the 2 and the 6 both through by 2 and end up with a reduced formula of C1H3. That would again be our empirical formula. All right? So, why do we do this? Well, as it turns out, if I go into the lab and I synthesize a compound, I want to be able to show that I've actually synthesized what I thought I synthesized, what I made in the lab is actually what I think it is. So one thing that we do is we actually physically do what's called an elemental analysis on that compound. An elemental analysis gives us the empirical formula. All right? So what do we do? We determine empirical formula directly by a technique called elemental analysis. So we're going to see how that works in just a moment. But what information do we get out of it? Well, in the end, the results of, empir of um, elemental analysis will tell us what elements are present in the compound and also what relative ratios to one another those elements will be found in. So in other words, that's all the same information that we get from an empirical formula. So for example, if I'm talking about um, methane or CH4 here, my empirical formula is CH4. That tells me I've got four hydrogen atoms in the, for every atom of carbon in the compound. Okay? So it tells me what elements are present and in what relative ratios to one another. Okay? Same information as in an empirical formula. So how do we do elemental analysis? How is it carried out actually as an experiment in the lab? Well, what we do is we fall back on a combustion reaction. So combustion reaction is when the compound of interest is actually burned or react with an excess of oxygen gas. Combustion products for compounds that contain things like carbon and hydrogen are always the same. So if I have a compound that contains only carbon and hydrogen, which we call a hydrocarbon, and we burn it in excess of oxygen, there's only two products that we're going to get. Those products are going to be carbon dioxide gas and water vapor. All right? So you can see here in this reaction, all of the carbon that was originally in the compound is converted to carbon dioxide as my product. All of the hydrogen that was originally in the compound is now converted to water as our product. All right? So what I ultimately want to know is how much carbon and how much hydrogen am I getting out of the compound as combustion products. All right? So the way we do this is we have a combustion furnace. So this is a closed container where the burning process can occur. So the sample, in this case a hydrocarbon, we'll keep it very simple here, CXHY, I don't know what the empirical formula is, that's what I'm trying to find out. 
I'm going to put this unknown hydrocarbon into the combustion furnace and I'm going to burn it. All right? So what's going to come out of this are going to be my combustion products, which are the carbon dioxide and the water vapor. Now, what I'm going to have here is I'm going to have individual traps here that are going to actually sequester or trap those two compounds. So in my CO2 trap, I'm going to sequester only carbon dioxide that's coming out of the combustion furnace. Likewise, everything that isn't carbon dioxide will be passed through that trap, will not be sequestered. We'll then move on to a water trap. And in the water trap, water will be trapped or sequestered, and only water. So in the end, what I can do is I can weigh the trap before the reaction, I can weigh the trap after the reaction, and of course the law of conservation of mass tells me that the difference in mass has to be due to, in this case, the mass of the carbon dioxide that gets sequestered in there. I can do the very same thing with the water. I take the mass of the trap before the reaction, and I take the mass of the trap after the reaction. The difference between the two has to be the mass of the water that's been trapped there. Okay? So what I've got at the end of the experiment is a mass of carbon dioxide in this trap, and I've got a mass of water in the water trap. So now what I ultimately need to do is to use some mole-to-mole -mole relationships to get back to just the mass of the carbon, which came originally from the um, hydrocarbon sample, and also the hydrogen. So the way I do this is I have my mass of my carbon dioxide. I'm going to convert that to moles of carbon dioxide, which we know how to do. And then once I have the moles of carbon dioxide, I can relate that to the moles of carbon in the carbon dioxide. I can do that because I know for every one mole of carbon dioxide, I've got one mole of carbon. Once I have the moles of the carbon, then I can convert that to grams of carbon because I know the mass of one mole of average carbon atoms. All right? I can do the very same thing with the water trap. I start with the mass of the water. I can convert that to moles of water because I know what the mass of one mole of water is. I can then, through my relationship in my formula, recognize that for every one mole of water, I have two moles of hydrogen. Once I have the moles of hydrogen, because I know the mass of one mole of hydrogen, I can convert that to grams of hydrogen. So now I know what the mass of my carbon that came originally from the hydrocarbon sample was, and I also know the mass of the hydrogen that came originally from the hydrocarbon sample. So next we'll see how to work it up into something that we can actually use. So, what we saw just a moment ago, folks, is that from an elemental analysis experiment for a simple hydrocarbon, I can get the grams of both the hydrogen and the carbon that were originally in the unburned compound. Once I have those, typically what we do with them is we express them as percents by mass of each element in the original compound. All right? So, for example, if I want to calculate percent of mass of carbon in the original compound, I'll take the grams of carbon that I got from the elemental analysis experiment, and knowing that it came only from the combustion of the um, compound, I can take the mass or grams of compound in the numerator, take the grams of carbon divided by the grams of the compound I started with, because that's the only source of the carbon that I had, multiply it by 100%, and I get a percent mass of carbon. All right, so typically, when we get empirical formula data, it's going to come to us as percent mass. So normally, we would have an elemental analysis set up that would allow us to have a trap for any element that we want. So we could have a trap for carbon, a trap for hydrogen. Typically, we will not have an oxygen trap, but we can come back and get oxygen. We could have a trap for nitrogen, a trap for sulfur, all in terms of the various oxides of those particular components. All right? So, point is, regardless of what the compound contains, we can determine what the mass of each element in that sample of that compound was, and then present that as a percent by mass. So, let's use that kind of data now to see how we would actually calculate an empirical formula for a compound. So here's a very simple example. Let's calculate the empirical formula of a compound that's found by elemental analysis to be 15.8% carbon and 84.2% sulfur by mass. Okay, So the assumption is we have only those two components present, so the total mass of the compound has to be the sum of those two. So to make the math easy, here's what we're going to do. Since these are already in terms of percent by mass, I'm going to make the assumption that I'm starting with 100 grams of compound. 
if I do that, then I know that the 15.8% carbon is directly converted to 15.8 grams of carbon, right? Because 15.8 divided by the assumed 100 grams of carbon times 100% takes you back to the 15.8% carbon, all right? Likewise, we can take the 84.2% sulfur and just convert that directly to grams of sulfur. They're gonna be one and the same. Now, once I have these masses of the two components, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert each one of those back to their respective mole amounts. All right, so let's just go ahead and quickly do that. In terms of my carbon, I know that if I have 15.8 grams of carbon, I can put a conversion factor in here that says that one mole of carbon from the periodic table is 12.011 grams of carbon. Okay, we all know how to do that. And we know that grams will cancel with grams. I'm left with moles of carbon. If I work that out, it turns out to be 1.31546. Take this way out, moles of carbon. And if we keep track of our sig figs here, we're good to three sig figs here. So that means we're good to three sig figs in this answer. But I'm going to carry out beyond that. All right? We can do the same sign of conversion for the sulfur here. I know from the periodic table that one mole of sulfur corresponds to a mass of 32.066 grams of sulfur. There we go. And if I do the math here, that turns out to be 2.62583 moles of sulfur. Again, that's going to be good to three sig figs if we're keeping track. Now, the way to get to the empirical formula now is we're actually going to write out the perspective formula for this. I know that it has to have carbon in it, and I know that it has to have sulfur. So what I'm going to do is a subscript to the right of each one of these elemental symbols is I'm going to write the number of moles of that particular element down there. So as a subscript to carbon, I've got 1.31. 546 moles of carbon. And then for the sulfur, I'm going to write down its mole amount. Again, as a subscript, 2.62583, it looks like. Now, to get the empirical formula, what we do is we're going to divide both of those through by the smallest quantity. So in this case, we see the smallest quantity is that of carbon. Okay, so I'm going to divide both through by the moles of carbon that I've got. All right, and when I do that, I'm gonna see how those ratio out. And if we're lucky, they're gonna ratio out to whole numbers. Now, sometimes they won't, and we'll see what happens when that happens a little bit later on in class. We'll see examples of that. But for now, it looks like these are gonna ratio out to nice whole numbers. So what I end up getting is C1 S2 as my empirical formula for this particular compound. Now, is that the actual formula of the compound? I don't know. The actual formula of the compound could be that, or it could be, again, some multiple of that. We need to have other pieces of information to be able to then determine what the actual formula for the compound is. And again, we will practice with that next time in class. All right, so that's enough for today, and we will see you next time.